You're listening to the Mind Over Murder podcast. My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the Unsolved Colonial Parkway Murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook group, together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Welcome back to Mind Over Murder. I'm Bill Thomas. And I'm Kristen Dilley. So we're starting the new feature we spoke about a few weeks ago, which is we're going to be featuring cases in partnership with Othram Labs, the DNA testing lab used by law enforcement. They're based in beautiful The Woodlands, Texas, outside Houston. Kicking it off will be the lovely and talented and sometimes mysterious Kristen Dilley. So the first victim that we're going to be talking about is a hiker who goes by the name Mostly Harmless. He also had two other aliases, Ben Bellamy and Denim. Mostly Harmless was a hiker aged 35 to 50. And we'll post a picture of him so that you can take a look for yourself and see where you think he falls on that age range. He was five foot eight and 83 pounds at the time of his death. He was found on July 23rd, 2018 in a tent in Big Cypress National Preserve, which is in Collier County, Florida. His cause of death is unclear. We do know that he had no tattoos, no scars, and no medical implants, which Bill and I were both commenting is a little odd. His fingerprints do not match any government database. He had no driver's license, no cell phone, no credit cards, no identifying information of any type. The only things he had with him at the time of his death were notebooks, which he was writing computer code in, hiking gear, and a substantial amount of cash. Now, a couple of interesting things. Law enforcement and Othram Labs do not believe that he met any kind of foul play. They think he died of natural causes. Sadly, he appears to have starved to death. People that met him along the trail, and there are numerous photographs of him meeting people along the Appalachian Trail and then later the Florida Trail. He was friendly and and forthcoming, and he allowed people to take his picture and so on. He used these multiple aliases, but he doesn't appear to have been the victim of any crime. Sadly, he died alone in this tent, and what the good people at Othram Labs and the Collier County Sheriff's Department are attempting to do is give this man a name. We know a little bit more about him. He told people that he met along the way that he was from New York State and that he was walking, hiking, from New York State to Florida. His ultimate goal was to make it to the Florida Keys and then turning around and walking back, which I I find very striking. He mentioned that he had worked in New York, some people said Brooklyn, and that he'd worked for big tech companies. He made a point of not signing the trail registries. He did sometimes when required, he would sign this Ben Billamy, everybody thinks is an alias. He sometimes did odd jobs at camps and other places along the trail to make money. And as Kristen said, he may have been carrying a large amount of cash. He referenced an abusive father in this seemed to be at the New York end of things. At least one or two people who met him, you know, at trail camps along the way said that when they got into long conversation, you know, and it was just two hikers shooting the breeze long into the night, he mentioned this abusive background. So it sounded like he was leaving some things behind. From a hiker's perspective, he made some rookie mistakes. People originally called him Denim when he first appeared on the Appalachian Trail up in New York State because he wore jeans, which are heavy and hot and not great hiking attire, for the first few weeks before he upgraded to better quality hiking gear. Even with the changes that he made, his tent was too large, his pack weighed 50 pounds, which is exceptionally heavy. Through hikers will tell you the gear is so advanced and so lightweight that through hikers will end up with packs that are 20 pounds or, you know, much, much lighter and more compact. So even at the end of the trail, no puns intended here, he was still using some gear that was probably heavier than it needed to be. And people kind of put that into a rookie mistake category. 
His death may be related to the wildfires that took place. This, these are two years ago now. He may have felt somewhat restricted in his ability to get out of the big cypress area where he was camping. Although people said he was hiker skinny when they met him along the trail, he was definitely not 83 pounds. And Kristen and I are looking at these photographs saying he looks thin but healthy. Mm -hmm. He may have actually starved to death, that he felt like he couldn't get out of this particular area and got stuck. It's mentioned that he was only five miles from Interstate 75, which is a major highway with a, you know, less than an hour's hike, he could have been at a place where he could have found food and shelter and safety. And sadly, that never happened. As Bill mentioned, this is not a case of foul play. This is not a murder investigation. This is an attempt to make sure that this man has a a name to go with his face and to make sure that his family has some answers as to what happened to him. So if you think that you can help, we will go ahead and put pictures of Mostly Harmless, and we'll put links to some articles on the DNA Solves website on our social pages. And we do invite you to go take a look at the particulars of the case. And if you do happen to recognize Mostly Harmless or know something about the case, we hope that you'll contact the appropriate authorities so that we can help give this man a name. In kicking off this series, there's two ways for you to help. There's contribute funds. Now, in this example, they needed to raise $5,000 for the DNA testing. They've successfully met their goal, so they don't need funding. They would very much like you to consider adding your DNA profile from any of the consumer DNA websites to the dnasolves.com website. It's free. It's only available to law enforcement to solve cases like this, missing people, unidentified people, rape and murder victims. It's strictly confidential, but it's something that we want to urge you to consider doing. And We'll be featuring other cases as things unfold. And now we're going to go ahead and finish up our conversation with DNA expert Rock Harmon. Thank you for joining us on Mind Over Murder. States that don't collect from arrestees, in many instances, this really surprised me, in many instances, the state laws just said, okay, if you're one of these people, then that guy over there is going to collect from you. Okay, when I say that guy over there, I mean probation, prison, parole. In other words, local law enforcement that produced the conviction created this guy's requirement that he be in the database then dump the responsibility for making sure it happened on somebody else that doesn't have that same interest. And and if you look at a lot of states, that's exactly what what you'll find. What we did, if you look at our law today, one of the things that's in there, and and this has kind of been preempted by the, the arrestee provision, but imagine you see this in those Ohio stories. They let it, left it up to somebody else, and suddenly they realized that wasn't happening. If you look at our law, and this is a holdover from before the arrestees, we required the judge before a guy was sent to make sure that a sample was collected. And if you look at the Ohio series, that's the solution that they finally realized had to be done. Here's a guy going through a door, and he's going to one of four or five other places, why not collect from him at the door? That was a critical part of our law until we started collecting from arrestees. And I I know in Alameda County, it was one of the things that I did to check up all the time. Just I I make sure samples were collected from people. It's a pretty simple concept if people decided they had a role in it too, which they do instead of just kissing it off on on other people. So here's our big question. This is the one I'm prepared to be gobsmacked about. There are 2.3 million people in prison in the U.S., Mm -hmm. and 700,000 are for violent offenses. Of those 700,000, how many do you think are not in CODIS? You know what? Nobody can answer that. It, it tens of thousands, I, you know, because, yeah, tens of thousands. I, there's just, there's no way to know until you start asking. It, it, oh, that's man. the sad thing. And there's no, you know, this is not a secret among people 
in government crime labs or CODIS people. And, 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 but it's been allowed to fester for so long, it just gets passed on to the successor person who thinks because that's the way it is, that's the way it's supposed to be. It may not be a secret among law enforcement people. I don't think the American public knows that tens of thousands of violent offenders, I'm talking about the worst of the worst here. I'm not talking yeah. about somebody that got busted on a, on a pot by for what we used to call nickel bag when I was in high school. We're talking mm-hmm. about rapists and murderers. Yeah. And you just said you think, and I think you're right, of these 700,000 violent offenders currently incarcerated in the United States, you think tens of thousands of inmates are not in the CODIS system. Okay. Yep. Yeah. No, and, and you know what? There's only one way to find out, and that's to look. <laughs> yeah. No, I, and it's uh, funny. Every, it's every, not like this, like you said at the top of the conversation in the last episode, this isn't rocket science. They need to be tested, and they need to be tested now. Yep. See, you limited your question. Y- yes, I, I know. Answered it. I, I answered it the way I did because I wanted to add something to it. Okay, you you talked about in prison. Correct. And I want to talk about out there in the community. Yeah. A talk, state collection. Talk to us and about this. Sure. If you look at the Nevada stories, you will realize that when they reconsidered their statutory interpretation, it was simply about people in prison. They have no plan to collect from all those people who were in prison, should have been collected, and got parole. And who's more dangerous to our community, our law-abiding citizens, who's more dangerous? The guy who's locked up for the rest of his life? or the guy who's out there. I think we know the answer. That was one of the explicit points that when I talked with Seth about that article, it became clear they weren't going to touch that, and which is kind of mind-boggling. But, you know, let, let me throw another category to you of people who are out there. Registered sex offenders. Mm-hmm. Okay. We're both nodding so, our heads. Mm-hmm. So if, if you're a registered sex offender, and states vary, there's a lot of variation. I have to say for an ultra-liberal state, California has cared an awful lot about crime victims, a lot more than, than conservative states have. It's one of those things that defies description or characterization. So in California... If, if, unless they, I know they've been talking about changing this, but in California, if you've ever been convicted of one of the crimes that requires you to register, it requires you to register for life. And along with the registration requirements, it's an annual registration event. If you move, you have to notify the place you lived and the police department where you're moving to. If you go into another state, you have to go through that same process between states. It provides a, an annual opportunity to get collect your DNA for the database. I can't tell you how good California has been on doing that, but we have these explicit, very simple mechanisms that allow you, you know, if you have 365 sex registrants and they all have to register within 10, I think it's 10 days of their birthday, all you have to do is sit there for a year and you'll be caught up and other states don't have quite the same stringent, but they have very similar ones. Currently, Washington State just got a grant from the federal government. I believe the number is 30,000 to collect from 30,000 sex registrants. And that means they're, they've been out there for some time. It would seem to me it's taken a long time of ignorance to collect from them or to not collect from them, to suddenly to say, okay, here's 30,000 guys who need money to do 30,000 people. If they have that, everybody has that problem. I'm sure. And, you know, sadly, this is what, and law, you know, the sex registration, that's a law enforcement event. That happens, I believe, in every state at the police department. So it's not like 
it's the prison people or the probation people. These are the cops whose cases they want to solve. Right. But for some reason, they never collected from 30,000 people. You've mentioned two really simple ideas. If we were to establish a policy, and I think we'd have to allocate the funds. In other words, you can't have an, you know yet another unfunded mandate. Yep. But you could set up a system that required when registered sex offenders do their, in most cases, annual registration with yep. law enforcement, they would be required to give their DNA as a condition of their RSO, registered sex offender, status and being sure. permitted to be out in the community. And if you, sure. did the sa- if you did the same thing with every person out on parole for a, a violent yeah. offense, you... It's not, it's not rocket science. Yeah. Know? Over the course yeah. of a year, you could rectify this situation and put tens of thousands of additional profiles. And look, I hope some of those people are never involved in another crime as long as they live. Yeah. But you could probably solve thousands of cases... Yeah. Or at least provide information to investigators that yeah. these profiles have a hit and require additional investigative resources. Sure. See, when uh, let, let me just add something. And what I, you know, I'm proud of what California did. And you know why we did it? Because we just sat down and talked about it. So what are we trying to do here? So built into that sex registration annual sex registration event as the, as the event that triggers this. It, it, we also made it, it is a crime to refuse to give a sample if you're required to. So picture the guy coming in, register on his birthday. You say, oh, by the way, you owe a sample. He says, I don't want to give you one. I say, sit down over there, you hooked up. Uh, and would you give this, and we're going to charge you with this new crime. And that would be the new mechanism and the judge can sentence you to jail or prison if that's what he wants to do. So we, we set up these very simple, you know, mechanisms that a systematic implementation of them would do away with a lot of the problems. And I don't think most people did that. So when I was talking to Bill last night about all of this, because we frequently have conversations about the problems that come up with CODIS, I said, maybe this is a stupid question, but couldn't we just take care of this problem by mandating a a federal law? If we do need federal action, who should lead the effort on this? Is this a DOJ problem? Like, who needs to be taking care of this? Look at what's going on with masks today. You know, I just... I hate, I hate press conferences. I've never been to a press conference that accomplished anything. So I can just see the press conference that, that accompanies this. But that, <laughs> that's, just not the, that's just not the way to do it. It really isn't the way to do it. First off, nobody in a position of authority is going to propose there's a problem that needs to be fixed. This stuff's been going on for years. This is not, this is not new. And uh, as you know, uh, Bill, you talked about the institutional stuff. Um, there's just different institutions. Who, which institution is going to say, I knew about it and didn't do anything about it until now? That's the same issue with familial searching. You asked me why people aren't doing it, because people don't have serious conversations about it. And the longer they don't have the conversations, the less likely it is that they ever will have one. But, Rock, I'm not interested in pointing fingers at all. I'd rather turn that finger around and point the way to, look, I think if we acknowledge we've got a problem, but here's some simple steps that we could take on a national level to turn us in the right direction, it isn't a matter of blaming anybody. Um, I, I, except, I totally agree. I totally agree. Except maybe offenders. But no one's saying... You know, the, the world is so different. I remember we were, went to a presentation by the FBI in 2010 after the Colonial Parkway murders had heated up significantly. They flew us in from around the country, which I'm told is very unusual. This was at FBI expense, and they briefed yeah. us on the case. This was all, uh, you know, starting with a case that began in 1986 with my sister and her girlfriend's murder and followed by these other three couples. One of the things they did very impressive guy named Alex J. Turner was the special agent in charge. 
He, in briefing us on the case and the status of the investigation, made a point of mentioning all the new tools that are available to investigators, you know, this was in 2010, that were not available when these crimes took place. And our our murders run 86 to 89. All of these amazing developments like CODIS, and he gave us a whole series of, uh, we jokingly called them the alphabet soup. They were all these acronyms. I know the government loves its acronyms, but they were, they had all come online after the Colonial Parkway murders had happened. The fingerprint database and the DNA database and, and on and on and on, all these amazing new developments. So we can't get stuck with old laws that don't fit the new science. It isn't a matter of Kristen or Bill or Rock pointing a finger saying, you guys are at fault. It's more a matter of saying, we think here are some common sense solutions that would help address the problem. And, you know, like you mentioned in the previous episode, you know, these things rolled out in the early 90s as... DNA became available, but, you know, your work as a career prosecutor stretches back till, what, the early 70s? Mid-74. Yeah. 74. Yeah. So your career actually covers the arc of a pre-DNA environment all the way to where we find ourselves now. Mm-hmm. No one's saying that anyone is at fault. We're just saying, you know, there's been some problems here. We have an opportunity to fix them. And here are the, I don't know, six simple steps we could come up with that we either need to at a federal level or every state in the union has to do this with model legislation. Knowing what I know about state houses, I think this might be a heck of a lot simpler to implement on a national basis. Am I wrong? You still have to get an an acknowledgement of what the problem is. I, I, it's just not, it's just not forthcoming. You don't think a plunging close rate on homicides, you know, we went from a 90 plus percent close rate 50 years ago to two thirds and dropping. You know, if you kill someone tomorrow, you've got a 40% chance of, yeah. of getting literally getting away with murder. Oh no. I, I mean, that's, People just don't appreciate that. Yeah. Now, honestly, there's just there's just so little interest in this. I, you know, I think one of the things that I, I forgot to say is it, that supports your idea is, so what happened to Nevada when they suddenly acknowledged they had 8,000 or however many they did? The federal government gave money to do it. You don't housebreak your dog that way. You don't raise your kids that way by rewarding negative activity, but that's what <laughs> seems to be happening here. Is that whenever you don't do what you were supposed to do, that maybe other people are doing with their own money. We're just giving you money to make up for it. Well, um, it is money isn't an ex, an excuse eliminator. In other words, every sure. you know, and look, I, I recognize the economy is in a tough spot right now, but states are always going to say we don't have the money. Uh, no, and the federal, in this field, if the federal government doesn't bail you out, nobody will. Okay? You're, you're absolutely right. This is, well, these are local problems, local issues that require local solutions. They don't happen without federal bailout. So that's fine, you know, as, as a solution. Yeah, I, I uh, you know, using, Everybody holds Nevada out as an anomaly. And that's only because they haven't had to answer those kind of questions. But combine Ohio with Nevada, I would hope that California doesn't have those problems. And that, I think that's just because we view that if we don't, if, it's because we anticipated and we developed infrastructure or mechanisms so that we could see what was going on. It wasn't rocket science to sit down and think about those things, but we decided that that was the approach to take, and that's, that's what we did. You know, we've never talked about cold hit follow-up. Maybe that's for another, no, that has to be for another day. All right, we'll do it another day. Yeah. Let's throw in 
those two cases where the Texas inmates were executed, okay? And uh, did, did you read those stories I sent you? We did, dutifully. Yeah, the, the genealogy. So this gets back to a point I made in the very beginning. Whenever CODIS works or the searching works or genealogy works, it provides a great opportunity to say, hey, how well are we doing here? Why did this happen now? And so, well, those two cases, the one from Texas and one from Oregon, the genealogy shows you what it can do. It can solve unsolvable cases. It also showed that these two guys were executed by Texas at a time when Texas had a law requiring guys like that on death row to have provided DNA samples. That led to Seth, through public records request, getting a list of about 200 inmates who similarly had been executed. Do you like our show, Mind Over Murder, and want to create your own podcast? Well then, let us tell you about Anchor. First of all, it's free. And who doesn't love free, right? I like free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. You can even add any song from Spotify directly to your episodes. The possibilities are endless for what you can create, whether it's music analysis, your own radio show, or something the world's never heard before. Anchor will then distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more platforms. And you can even make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. I like the sound of that. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Right here, Anchor. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started on your own podcast. You can tell them Kristen and Bill from Mind Over Murder sent you. One of the most frequent questions we're asked here at Mind Over Murder is, how can I help? Thanks to Othram, a leading forensic DNA testing lab for law enforcement, you can get involved and help solve real cases. If you have tested at a consumer genetics company, you can contribute your data to dnasolves.com. The process is easy and confidential. Just two simple steps. Your DNA might be the missing piece that helps solve the identity of an unknown person. Then Mind Over Murder will highlight cases Othram is working on to seek your crowdfunding support for DNA testing to help solve these cold cases. Upload your DNA profile to dnasolves.com. It's easy, free, and confidential. Then join Mind Over Murder as we help families find answers with Othram and dnasolves.com. by Texas in spite of their DNA collection law. And as far as I know, that's still the case. And if you, as I did, and as Seth did, you just Google those guys, you realize they were suspected of tons of other crimes that they weren't convicted of at the time. So here, getting back to your position, Bill, as a, as a victim survivor, Here's a a tremendous opportunity to find out that the guy who did this this to your daughter or your wife, the case was never solved, and was executed for it. And and a feeling of dissatisfaction of knowing that that is over. And Texas, a very conservative, execution-happy state, executed people without providing the opportunity, the very simple opportunity of getting a sample, comparing it to all those other cases that they thought the guy did, and typing it, and, provide, and contacting the victims who were contacting Because the other thing, too, is whenever you have an open case, the police could be suspecting the wrong guy. You know, that, that happens. That's what DNA does. It tells you whether you're onto the guy or not. To, to the best of my knowledge, Texas has done nothing to rectify the situation. Is part of the fear there... Do you think that to test the DNA of a man that's been executed is also potentially to open up the door to we executed the wrong man? Well, there's a tremendous lot of energy devoted to that, and it's 
never been demonstrated, <laughs> despite what people think about it. It's never been demonstrated that that's happened. Oh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not taking that position. I'm just. No, no, no. It's a. It's a good. It's a good point. And there's uh, there's a real good chance that the folks that were on death row are not exactly Boy Scouts, of course. Uh, sure. No, it's, it's Seth and I both just do a Google search, and some of these guys, there's a whole history, you know, in their rogues gallery of things. So, you know, it's like DNA does, it does what it does. It does what it's supposed to do. What meaning it has, people have to attribute to that in the context of whatever information they have. I, I, I think if you look at how those two news stories describe it, it's as if it was a conscious decision to execute them and not collect a sample because they're going to execute them. That's what drew my attention to those two stories. I thought, could you say that again, please? Because t- it didn't make sense the first time. It doesn't make sense the second time or the hundredth time either. It would be great if somebody in Texas cared about that to, to do something about it. Seth never got to write that story. So I always think it's important to kind of end on a a note of what can be done to remedy a situation. So what would you say are the steps that can be taken to remedy this CODIS gap? Sure. I I think uh, an effort on a national level to review state laws and assist them in interpretation and addressing the kinds of problems that are here that we've talked about for the last hour. Retroactivity force, uh, it's the recurrent theme in, in, in all of these. And, and if there are other reasons, they'll get flushed out too. There's a, a mechanism to do that. There is an annual CODIS users conference where this can happen. This can be brought up. In the early days, I was a regular speaker at that. That was before I knew all this stuff. I wouldn't be invited back to speak on this. Are you, are you serious? You wouldn't be invited back to speak about these issues? No. Well, who's running this thing? The FBI. They really wouldn't want you in the room? Well, I, I, I can't say that. I, I, well, you did just come up pretty close to saying that. No, I... I I haven't bothered to even submit an abstract because I doubt it would be, I doubt it would be worth anybody's while. Okay. Ultimately, Hmm. I don't think it would come out that way. Well, Um, what about this? What, what about, uh, well, we'll get this uh, coronavirus thing cleared up and uh, why don't we, you know, Kristen, Bill rock, why don't we all go? Yeah. Sure. It sounds like it, fun. It, well, no, it, it is. I, you know, as I said, I used to. I, I think I think my welcome wore out when we were talking about familiar searching. <laughs> that's, when they, that's when things went south with them. But um, my guess is you still have friends in the room. Oh, no, totally. And, and look, and and people don't like the message, and they and they end up not liking the messenger. And that's their problem. I don't know. Um, you strike us as very likable. Yeah. Yeah. I, I am, unless it's your problem. And <laughs> well, <laughs> but like we talked about, if we can point the way without sure. everybody, and I just rolled my eyes, you can probably hear that over the podcast, without <laughs> without every institution feeling like we're criticizing them as opposed to saying, look, here's a problem. Here's some potential solutions. But, you know, I, I wrote, you know, just now, I wrote down in my notes, re- as you spoke, retroactivity, the use of force. And I'm not implying that we need to torture inmates or anything like that. But I think part of the condition of their incarceration needs to be, for a, for a violent offense, needs to be, oh, and by the way, we need your DNA, full stop. Sure. Well, if mm-hmm. you if you if you reflect back on something I said a little while ago, it's very simple to overcome these problems. Remember, I said in out in in California, other than the arrestees, 
before we had the Orestes, and it's still in our law, the judge is supposed to make sure you, you got a sample, you gave a sample before you get sentenced. That guy is very vulnerable at that point in time. He wants the sentence that he got bargained for. Right. If it wasn't a plea bargain, the sentence is open. If he messes around and not gives a sample, that's going to screw up whatever he's hoping for at that day. So in that sitting, he is highly motivated. That's why we did it. We did it that way because we wanted local control over it. But we did it that way because that guy's very vulnerable and motivated to give a sample then. The other thing that we learned over time is if the guy knows that resistance will not produce a sample, he's going to screw with you. If all it takes is a good deputy sheriff, bailiff, whatever you call them in your jurisdiction, to say, look, this is what's going to happen. It's going to happen the hard way or the easy way. It virtually eliminates every resistance. It really does. So to uh, to allow it to be known that refusal or resistance is not going to be overcome without getting a court order, guess what's going to happen? You're going to have to get court order. Everybody's going to say no. They're, so they're going to fight you every step of the yeah. way. And besides, yeah. as I've said about inmates before, they've got nothing else to do. Exactly, yeah. No, I, I think a, a, an, an effort, a, a concerted effort, you know, I, I, I often said I'd be willing to be part of that process, and the only qualification is I'd, I'd be willing to do it if I thought it was real. But, you know, quite often, the same group, the Coach Users Group, they always had updates and assistance on changing their laws and things like that. You know, what I realized is very little of it had to do with practical interpretation of it. You know, it had to do with how you get your law expanded to have arrestees and things like that. This would be a critical evaluation of everybody's law, understanding what perceived problems they have and help in solving them. Uh, and, and at that point, I, th I think that would overcome I don't, I don't think there'd be any national legislature, nothing like that, you know? I, I, I really, and I think the, the, if they were forthcoming, like Nevada finally was, the federal government would kick in the money to do it, because that's what they do. But it's just getting to the point where the problems are identified, the magnitude of the problems, and... Look, hearing how other people solve them is part of it. Because if other people solve them and you have the, you have the same issues, it's I, I, I don't think I, it's hard to imagine that that's already happened in light of those stories that you have there. Well, I think that it's that age-old institutional resistance. You know, not yeah. not my problem. I've said on this podcast before, there's a reason why America has 200,000 cold case murders yeah. spread out across the United States and at least that number of rapes and sexual assaults. And it's yeah. the same as every other problem. It's a yeah. lack of time, attention, and resources. We've laughed too about, you know, we know that it's not rocket science is one of your favorite expressions. And when we were talking to Colleen Fitzpatrick about this case and others. Mm -hmm. She's actually a rocket scientist before she <laughs> yeah, became I know, I know, I know. <laughs> a forensic genealogist, and she's a big fan of yours. I'm not saying it would be easy, and it's not a finger snap, but even the things you've outlined in these two conversations are simple steps that could be taken that would help address the situation. The one thing I would add, too, to your retroactivity um, regarding DNA testing and requiring inmates to be tested, it, you're absolutely right on the parolees and registered sex mm. offenders. There's four elements that I can think of, and I'm just a civilian, yeah. but I, I, I see those as kind of four posts that if we could move those things forward, I think we would be getting a lot of answers to a lot of unsolved cases. Yeah. Um, look at, uh, you know, the Hammer murder, when I told you from Alameda County, you can imagine how many, whenever I see a cold case, sorry, I look at it, I, I look at it to try to figure out 
what's really going on. And for the most part, you know, nothing would make anyone happier if everyone happened as soon as it could have under the circumstances. That's all I need. That's perfect. That's perfection. But when you see things that don't make sense and then you go, okay, this, the truth is this is never going to come out because it, it's not flattering and it takes away from the celebration. We're big fans of forensic genealogy and we've had a lot of discussions about forensic genealogy on, on the show and we'll continue to and we totally support yeah. it. But something you said a few minutes ago I thought was kind of intriguing. Now, I'm interpreting what you said, so tell me if this is sure. accurate. Do you feel like forensic genealogy, as great as it is and as cool as it is, is actually kind of a workaround around some of the problems that you've been highlighting? Well, it has. It's, I mean, these successes have shown that, the two Texas cases, yeah. Uh, absolutely. And, and, you know, when you say workaround, that's not a pejorative term. God bless it for solving cases that our institutional mechanisms fail to solve through their own deficiencies. So I think it's taking any pressure off solving these other problems, including familiar searching, by having these fantastic unsolvable cases solved and with an answer that was always there, but it just waited for a beautiful solution like this. So in a sense, it has. It's, it's hard to say how many of them have occurred. I'll pick a number, 150. You put 150 over 500,000, that's not even scratching the surface. Yeah, I think it has taken away from the more plotting, familial searching, or CODIS, and taken away from any attention on CODIS. So, you know, because... You know, Case Colleen was involved in, and one up in Seattle. You know, it had it, it had some elements of missing code sample and familiar search and would have solved it as well. And so those are the questions that I think once the excitement wears off about solving the case, people need to be looking at, not to undermine genealogy, but just to say, we need to, and this is what I said before, and this is what I, I mean to say, Genealogy is a powerful tool, and wouldn't it be great if we were only using it on cases that couldn't be solved by our other means, like CODIS and familiar searching? That's a really good point. And to be fair, a number of the 150 cases that have been solved using forensic genealogy include offenders who were not previously in the system because in many cases they had, you know, not been arrested for anything. Uh, absolutely. That's when you realize the power of this thing, you know, familiar search, it requires a close relative in the database to work. So if you don't have that kind of family, genealogy is the only way. In fact, in a number, I can't tell you how many, but um, in a number of the genealogy successes, familiar searching was used. And it failed to produce a lead, which is what happens because you don't have a close relative in the in the offender database. Right. So right. you you see the you know the totally different premises, and that's why CODIS and the searching genealogy reflect kind of a continuum of different kinds of solutions. And there's no way to know which one's going to work until you do it. Let me ask a provocative question here. Oh, no. Do you think, do you think, <laughs> do you think America's law enforcement officers should be required to give their DNA and put it into the CODA system for elimination purposes? You know, uh, uh, yeah, the, uh, the simple answer is yes. I mean, you mentioned CODIS. Okay. And are you, are you touching on a recent case? I can't remember the details, but I know there was a, now, this is this is an okay. this is an idea I've had for a number of years, so I'm not. Well, okay. Well, there's a, there's actually a recent case. It's coming to me. A recent case from Florida. They solved it using genealogy, and the guy had been a cop in that same jurisdiction. And let me explain in the context of this is a union issue in many jurisdictions. And I was a union executive for a number of years, okay. not for so law, this, not in law enforcement. So, and you can understand, you know, union 
you represent your people. But for the most part, and I can't even quantify this, for the most part, the arguable value of having all the police officers in there is for a local database. It's not because you're going to try to find the cop who committed the crime. It's a contamination control. Correct. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so, so it's held by the local lab in case a profile shows up to make sure it's not the cop that responded to the crime. I don't think anybody is putting that in their state database. And if they're not putting it in the state database, it's not going into the national database. Do you follow me? So the, yes. the legitimately arguable scientific practical value is a contamination database. And that's why I believe many, if not all, CODIS labs have all their lab analyst profiles there too. Do, do you see where that goes? So, yeah, uh, makes sense. Uh, so that's why you asked CODIS, and I trimmed it back down to a local database that probably doesn't end up in the state database. If it's not in the state database, it's not in the national database. I could be wrong about how far that goes, but I, I think that's the practice. I think that makes sense. I just think it would be it would be helpful, and certainly when you are searching a crime scene, the potential for contamination is great because right. an officer, he or she enters a crime scene and they may be dealing with an active crime at that moment. Yeah. Their initial thought is going to be, the safety of the public and, of course, of themselves, and they are not going to be thinking about, at least initially, oh my gosh, I, you know, I need to be gloved, gloved up and masked up and whatever. I need to make certain that this place is secure first. Uh, I have thought for a number of years that I thought it would make sense that members of law enforcement and probably even other first responders, I'm thinking about Mm -hmm. uh, firefighters, uh, rescue workers, ambulance drivers, you know, that kind of thing, park rangers, Mm -hmm. all of them uh, who enter scenes, which at that moment, they don't even know that a crime has occurred. It would make a lot of sense. Do you know if the members of armed forces, all of whom now give their DNA, you know, typically when they enlist... Do you know if those DNA profiles are searchable by law enforcement? You know, I haven't heard this come up in a long, long time, but the answer then was and probably still is no, they're not. I mean, I have thought there are, you know, millions of service people. Sure. And, of course, you're a Naval Academy grad. I come from a Navy family with three Naval Academy grads, my father, My older brother, Richard, and my younger sister, Kathy, were the first father-son-daughter graduates of the Naval Academy. You know, it it has occurred to me there are millions of profiles of service personnel, and I've never been able to get a 100% answer about whether or not those databases were searchable. Yeah, I know. It is one of those mysterious subjects, but but I think think it was, you know, it wasn't hard in in the early days, in the mid-80s to understand what you could do and what you couldn't do. And try to develop practices that would make people appreciate that you were being as safe as could be. And and this was one of them. People that were opposed to it always had the slippery slope argument. That's why I believe the, the question of ha- having access to the military database has always been off limits. I'd be stunned if maybe somebody will call in and say that has changed, but I've never heard of a case where somebody was made on the military, on a a sample in the military database. Rock, what is next for you? Well, in about a half hour, I'm going to go for a walk with my wife and my son. uh, Honestly, I'm I'm winding down. You got to go sometime. um, (laughs) Well, we hope you're not going anywhere. (laughs) <laughs> no, uh, no, yeah, I don't know. Well, I know I'm not going to Hawaii next month the way I, I've been planning. Oh, uh, no. It was scheduled in June, and that got canceled, and they're just paralyzed over there. So, And I doubt there's much going on, so it's like that's not going to happen. No, I, uh, 
I, I did a long interview for an O.J. Simpson documentary, and I'm going to do another one sometime in the near future. But after that, I think I'm done. I, I it just because when you're when you're not really in the mix anymore, you really don't have the kind of you don't get the kind of opportunities to to input things. Plus, I think this experience that we're still going through. I hope it's taught everybody a lesson that time is valuable. My son is autistic, and we love going to for a walk out by the beach in Alameda, which we're going to do pretty soon. Oh, that's a so, nice image. Yeah. No, it's just uh, that's part of every day, my run, my bike ride, my going for a walk with him and my wife. So, no, it's, it's, uh, that's pretty much it. Well, with your permission, and you did open up that that uh, other can of worms for a further discussion, sure. we'd we'd love to talk with you again. Um, sure. you know, yeah. in the coming months, you've got so much background and enthusiasm and experience, and we really appreciate your insights. Sure, I will do that. Thank you so much for joining us, Rock, okay. and thank you all for listening to Mind Over Murder. Mind Over Murder is a production of Absolute Zero and Another Dog Productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder.